and don't cry. Your folks might understand you by and by. Just move on up toward your destination. Curtis Mayfield, my radio theme song. This is KBFG 107.3 Low Power FM Community Radio for North Seattle and the whole world. Streaming on www.kbfgseattle.org slash listen. Join us. Um, I would like to tell you our call-in phone number, but we're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulty working out that forwarding. Because we are not in the KBFG studio this morning. Oh, no. We are live from the secret garden. I've got Dr. Gabriela Gutierrez here. He moose. She is going to guide us through uh, most of an hour of Pablo Neruda. And we'll talk more about why that choice. My old friend, John Hawkley, has just arrived and is having his... 14th cup of coffee. Um, I can see some some signs of metabolism over there. He's sitting in the sun over by the flowers and the orb spiders, which are magnificent this morning. And we're in the secret garden. I'm going to take you back to Curtis Mayfield for a bit, and then we're going to uh, introduce our show. I'm Eric Moose, and I'm uh, pleased to be with you this morning. All right. Take it, Curtis. Do not obey, no must be for safe, but you can pass the test. Just move on up to a greater day. With just a little of faith, if you put your mind to it, you can surely do it. get into it here pretty quick. We are live from the Secret Garden. You're listening to KBFG 107.3. This is our, what's now seems to be a tradition, uh, 9 to 11 a.m. on Saturday mornings, open airwaves. Uh, uh, first started by uh, volunteers Kent and Dom as uh, community in quarantine, but uh, with so much else going on. They decided to uh, expand it and get more people involved, and uh, I agreed to take a shift, and my pals have shown up this morning to uh, join in, and uh, I'm glad they're here. You can uh, get involved with KBFG. Uh, We've been on the air about two and a half years. We certainly are interested in your voice. We do a lot of local music and local programming. But there's uh, still room for more. Uh, we've got plenty of plenty of space. If you look at our schedule, uh, anything that says local music, well, that's great. Uh, we we love putting out our local music, but uh, those spaces are at the moment uncurated, which means they are uh, yours for the taking. Uh, contact us through our website, and you can uh expect to hear back and we'll help you get a show developed we'd love to have your voice and the voice of your community on kbfg 107.3 i'm eric uh i'm going to give you a couple of uh, quick updates and then we're going to get into pablo neruda for the uh nine to ten hour uh first of all uh 
There are a whole lot of protests happening this weekend. Wanted to mention those. Uh, my go-to for information about those kind of events is The Stranger. Uh, as their, their Google search reveals, Seattle's only newspaper. Um, Black Lives Matter protests and resistance events this weekend in Seattle. And that's the page I'm on right now. There's uh, Art as Resistance on Beacon Hill at Jimi Hendrix Park, uh, a Solidarity Rally down in Tukwila, uh, Refuse Fascism at Green Lake Park, Stand With Us Shoreline. Uh, the event in Shoreline is a direct response to Kalen, a black youth activist and Shoreline resident who was recently the target of a hate crime by a close neighbor. There's a Youth Day of Action. Uh, that's at Broadway and East Pine. I'm not sure what time that is. Um, and uh, there's more stuff on, on Sunday. So check out The Stranger. Uh, there's been a lot going on in Portland, Oregon, of course, and that's on our mind because supposedly the feds have... Uh, the federal uh, unidentified extra legal secret police have arrived here in Seattle. Uh, we haven't, I haven't heard personally of any activity they've been involved in, but um, I received this last night uh, and I'm, I'm going to read it to you in full. Take a few minutes to do that. Uh, there is a lot of information going around that uh, Portland is out of control and the entire city is being looted by rioters, Marxists and communists. Here we go. Uh, this is uh, via a friend. I was floored by the information I recently received from my father-in-law, Alden Roberts. It is incredibly important that people know what is happening in Portland because, because it is very scary and has very real implications for our country. By way of context, Alden is a general surgeon retired as the chief medical officer of a hospital in Vancouver, Washington, and just finished his term as the chairman of the Washington Medical Commission, the state agency that licenses and oversees all doctors in the state. I share this information to emphasize that he is a community leader, a very smart, educated, and informed person, and is not one to exaggerate or spread misinformation. Here's what he has observed in Portland over the last few days. One, the protests are confined to a two-block radius around the courthouse, and if you're four blocks away, you can't tell anything has been happening. There is nothing going on outside of that region, and Portland is functioning as normally the pandemic will allow. It is not burning, nor is it out of control. Two, the protesters are absolutely peaceful at the protests that I've been a part of, and with the exception of graffiti, are completely within their constitutional rights to protest. The protests involve singing, chanting, and have used white walls to block whites who are trying to disrupt or corrupt the protests. Yes, cursing is rather commonplace. More than half the protesters are white. By the way, I look over at my friends right now as an aside. There will be no cursing on the public airwaves, you two. Okay. Back to it. More than half the protesters are white. All are protesting for Black Lives Matter, although the entrance of the federal paramilitary force has brought out a lot of people, including myself, who are incensed at the use of unregulated federal force against law-abiding citizens and against the will of the state and local governments. Three, all of the protesters are wearing masks to minimize transmission of, of covid However, as at times there are a thousand or more of us, it is hard, though not impossible, to maintain social distancing. When the federal paramilitary force is deployed, it becomes impossible. Four, the police responded unprovoked and were brutal, but nothing like the paramilitary force. There is a court order that forbids the police to use tear gas. I was not there when it was just the police. Five, at the protests I have attended, I did not witness any unlawfulness on the part of the protesters. Each time, the federal paramilitary personnel launched an apparently unprovoked attack. There have been no riots. The federal paramilitary forces had no training in crowd control, has no oversight, was not invited to Portland by local leadership, does not have any form of identification, they do not wear name badges, and they wear military camouflage. 
They are heavily armed with flashbang grenades, less lethal bullets, pepper bullets, pepper spray, and tear gas. They will pull goggles off of protesters and spray pepper spray into their eyes. They used a baton to beat a U.S. Navy vet, broke his hand, and sprayed pepper spray in his eyes because he asked why they weren't honoring their vow to protect the Constitution. During the assault, he stood still and did not risk resist until blinded by the pepper spray, at which point he turned around and walked away. The excuse me, the line of mothers on Sunday was gassed and shot with less lethal bullets for chanting Black Lives Matter. At least one was pregnant. A protester holding a sign up with both hands was shot in the head with a quote-unquote non-lethal bullet and will likely have permanent brain damage. While I have not personally seen this, There are videos of people being kidnapped into unmarked vans by the federal paramilitaries as they left the protest, held for a couple days, interrogated, then released without charges or explanation. At this time, the protests are no threat to Portland and only encompass a two-block area. They have been peaceful, with graffiti as the only illegal activity. They are well-controlled and supported by a cross-section of Portlanders. There is no reason for the federal government to be involved, and the excessive force being used appears to be nothing more than a political show force against U.S. citizens by the Trump administration. Six, about 3,000 protesters showed up last night, July 21st, all with masks, very well behaved. Certainly no chaos, no violence on the part of the protesters. I left at 10.30. The paramilitary attacked at 12.30. I spent an hour talking to the medics. They say they are being targeted by the paramilitary personnel. They are often the first to be shot and tear gassed. When they try to help an injured protester, the paramilitary personnel throw flashbangs and tear gas at them. They carry gas masks. One of them was beaten, dragged away from the injured person they were treating, and arrested. They are from OHSU, um, as well as Portland Fire. Seven. The elk statue was taken down by police to protect it, but the elk statue was a favor to the protesters because it was uncontroversial. So they got a blow-up elk and put it where the real statue used to stand. It's sort of a rallying point. Uh, He concludes, this should concern, if not terrify, all of us. This is an unidentified and unaccountable federal police presence attacking American citizens who are not violating any federal laws. This is literally how the secret police and other authoritarian regimes began. The comparison to the early stages of Nazi Germany is not an exaggeration anymore. Silence is complacency. Please share this post. Please share this information. Please get involved. Do not allow or condone this conduct by our federal government. I don't care which political party you support. This is an affront to the U.S. Constitution and the founding principles of our nation. Well, yeah, and uh, perhaps soon to be visited on a city near you. Uh, Stay safe, Portland, and... uh, All of you folks are in our our thoughts uh, this morning. We are going to turn our attention to uh, Mr. Pablo Neruda, one of the greatest poets our species has ever, ever produced. Nobel Prize winner and a man who died suspiciously within days of the murder of the president of Chile, Salvador Allende. Mr. Neruda was a close supporter of Mr. Allende. And how did Mr. Allende, the president, the duly elected president of Chile, die? He died in a U.S. funded and supported coup led by Chilean General Augusto Pinochet in 1973, September 11th, 1973. Uh, All of this is well documented. This was uh, uh, essentially run under the uh, uh, auspices of President Nixon. You'll remember him from the history books. And um, when we, uh, I've seen a lot of discussion, oh, this can't be happening in Portland. Um, and I have to point out here that the policies and your tax dollars have been funding exactly this kind of secret police work 
around the world, particularly in this hemisphere, in the Spanish-speaking world south of us. And uh, it's it's been happening for a long time, and it's here it is now on our shores and in our our cities but it's this is should not be a surprise to anyone um are you ready to read a poem uh let me get you up here yeah uh i had my uh... i would like to say a couple of things first okay um i initially um was very excited about speaking about neruda today um his real name is really, there's three first names, <laughs> and he changed his name to Pablo Neruda, which is um, actually the last name is Czech, <laughs> for those of you really? interested, yes, from Eastern Europe. Um, but this is so much to do with, with what's happening, as you said. Um, in Latin America, poets especially in the 20th century, were respected um, and they became the ambassadors, the politicians. Um, it was writers, uh, poets. Um, it was not movie stars <laughs> and Hollywood people. Um, and I wanted to, the, the, the link I always like to make because I teach Pablo Neruda both in English and Spanish, upper division courses, um, that in Spanish, uh, journalist is periodista. And I like them to remember the two P's, right? Political, politico, y periodista. Because that is so closely linked. Um, Unlike, it's, it's so hard for my students to understand that particularly in Chile, you are, um, your politics are reflected with your actions every day. And even to this day, I spent some time in Chile interviewing Chilean poets, writers, feminist women. And in the United States, we have some of that. We have some people that... Um, raise money for the homeless, whatever, um, well-intentioned people. But in Latin America, in the first, uh, I, well, the entire century, the politics were directly linked. And this is, uh, Pablo Neruda encapsulates, encapsulates, the um, the spirit of Latin America, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, he was an unusually um, well-traveled man, an international man, but he was also a man who linked Latin America, one country to the other, with his poetry by writing uh, poems to many people. And making Latin America a very together space, making Latin America pan-America. So we'll go back to that. But I just wanted to highlight that the political um, is very important to Latin American poets of his generation and particularly to him. All um, right. So uh, we'll begin with you reading um, Poema Veinte. Because if you were born or raised in, well, actually raised in Latin America, you are aware of Pablo Neruda and you probably gave um, 20 poemas de amor y una canción desesperada to your first girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> or boyfriend. In, so in, we'll have you read Poema 20 and I will read it in, uh, I will read something in Spanish as well. Uh, shall I go first? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Pablo Neruda, poem number 20. 20 love poems in a song of despair. Tonight I can write. Tonight I can write the saddest lines. Write, for example, the night is starry and the stars are blue and shiver in the distance. 
The night wind revolves in the sky and sings. Tonight I can write the saddest lines. I loved her, and sometimes she loved me too. Through nights like this one I held her in my arms. I kissed her again and again under the endless sky. She loved me. Sometimes I loved her too. How could one not have loved her great still eyes? Tonight I can write the saddest lines. To think that I do not have her, to feel that I have lost her, to hear the immense night still more immense without her. And the verse falls to the soul like dew to the pasture. What does it matter that my love could not keep her? The night is starry and she is not with me, that is all. In the distance someone is singing, in the distance. My soul is not satisfied that it has lost her. My sight tries to find her as though to bring her closer. My heart looks for her and she is not with me. The same night whitening the same trees. We of that time are no longer the same. I no longer love her, that's certain, but how I loved her. My voice tried to find the wind to touch her hearing. Another's. She will be another's, as she was before my kisses. Her voice, her bright body, her infinite eyes, I no longer love her, that's certain, but maybe I love her. Love is so short, forgetting is so long, because through nights like this one I held her in my arms. My soul is not satisfied that it has lost her, though this be the last pain that she makes me suffer, and these the last verses that I write for her. Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche. Escribir, por ejemplo, la noche está estrellada y tiritan azules los astros a lo lejos. El viento de la noche gira en el cielo y canta. Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche. Yo la quise ya veces, ella también me quiso. En las noches como esta la tuve entre mis brazos. La besé tantas veces bajo el cielo infinito. Ella me quiso a veces, yo también la quería. ¿Cómo no haber amado sus grandes ojos fijos? Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche. Pensar que no la tengo. Sentir que la he perdido. Oír la noche inmensa más inmensa sin ella. Y el verso cae al alma como el pasto al rocío. ¿Qué importa que mi amor no pudiera guardarla? La noche está estrellada y ella no está conmigo. Eso es todo. A lo lejos alguien canta. A lo lejos mi alma no se condenta con haberla perdido. Como para acercarla mi mirada la busca, mi corazón la busca y ella no está conmigo. La misma noche que hace blanquear los mismos árboles nosotros, los de entonces, ya no somos los mismos. Ya no la quiero, es cierto, pero cuánto la quise. Mi voz buscaba el viento para tocar su oído. De otro modo será, será de otro, como antes de mis besos, su voz, su cuerpo claro, sus ojos infinitos. Ya no la quiero, es cierto, pero tal vez la quiero. Es tan corto el amor y es tan largo el olvido. Porque en noches, como esta la tuve entre mis brazos, mi alma no se contenta con haberla perdido. Aunque este sea el último dolor que ella me causa y estos los últimos versos que yo le escribo. So, imagine writing and publishing Veinte poemas de amor y una canción desesperada when you were 19, 20 years old. The world opened up before him because he was sensational. And, um, and then, of course, he wrote incredible. He basically documented all the flora and the fauna um, in Canto General um, of Latin America. He um, inscribed Latin America, if you will, um, its uniqueness into um, the rest of the world 
um, I believe that before Pablo Neruda, Latin America really didn't exist to the rest of the world. So it globalized us. It also democratized uh, poetry. Um, and I know um, you talked to me about a poem about a certain, well, there is, there is an ode to a cat and an ode to a dog and an ode to his socks. And um, his Odas Elementales, I believe he wrote three, three books of Odas Elementales, Elemental Odes. And this was to, to, to everyday things, to objects. Um, it was almost pathetic because before this, um, people would write, you know, the modernists were right, um, to very romantic and elevated um, birds. or <laughs> And here he's writing an ode to his socks, to the onion. Um, so that to me is probably the most important um, thing that he did, those two things. Um, okay, so I, uh, I'd i like to do a uh, station ID and then read a poem uh -huh. about a dog. Okay. Uh, it may be not familiar to you. Oh, but, I have it in Spanish. But it, it, <laughs> it's almost... It, 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 it's almost, at least the first several lines are uh, d describing our setting right here in the Secret Garden where we're broadcasting from. Uh, this is Open Airwaves at KBFG 107.3, low power FM radio for North Seattle and streaming on the World Wide Web at kbfgseattle.org slash listen. I'm here with Dr. Gabriela Gutierrez y Moose from Seattle University and uh, my... Well, we've been playing music almost 30 years together, which is a long time. <laughs> um, before we had kids, uh, to, to put it in perspective. Um, and uh, we're going to take the second uh, half of uh, our, our program from 9 to 11 this morning. But we did uh, seem to get our phone working. Uh, it does ring at uh, another volunteer's house, but she's... Uh, agreed not to answer the phone during our show. So uh, I'll give you our phone number. It's 206-317-4518. But mainly uh, this morning we're, we've uh, uh, gotten into Pablo Neruda, and I'm going to read you one of the animal poems from Pablo Neruda. My dog has died. I buried him in the garden next to a rusted old machine. Some day I'll join him right there, but now he's gone with his shaggy coat, his bad manners, and his cold nose. And I, the materialist who never believed in any promised heaven in the sky for any human being, I believe in a heaven I'll never enter. Yes, I believe in a heaven for all dogdom, where my dog waits for my arrival, waving his fan-like tail in friendship. I, I not speak of sadness here on earth, of having lost a companion who was never servile. His friendship for me, like that of a porcupine, withholding its authority, was the friendship of a star, aloof, with no more intimacy than was called for, with no exaggerations. He never climbed all over my clothes, filling me full of his hair or his mange. He never rubbed up against my knee like other dogs obsessed with sex. No, my dog used to gaze at me, paying me the attention I need, the attention required to make a vain person like me understand that being a dog, he was wasting time. But with those eyes so much purer than mine, he'd keep on gazing at me with a look that reserved for me alone all his sweet and shaggy life always near me, never troubling me, and asking nothing. <sighs> How many times have I envied his tail as we walk together on the shores of the sea in the lonely winter of Isla Negra, where the wintering birds filled the sky and my hairy dog was jumping about full of the voltage of the sea's movement, my wandering dog sniffing away with his golden tail held high face to face with the ocean spray, Joyful, 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 as only dogs know how to be happy, with only the autonomy of their shameless spirit. There are no 
goodbyes for my dog who has died, and we don't know now and never did lie to each other. So now he's gone, and I buried him, and that's all there is to it. That was translated uh, from the Spanish, it, my notes say here, by a person named Alfred Yankauer. I don't know anything about Mr. Yankauer, but I do know about translating poetry because I've seen someone work very hard at it during the pandemic. You have been translating. How many poems have you translated during quarantine from Spanish to English? Oh, I'm sorry. I've got your mic down. Um, there we go. Yeah. Um, and you're working on a book. Can you describe that a little bit? Um, I'm working on two. Uh, I'm j I just finished two anthologies of um, Latinx. Um, one uh, literature, one is poetry to be published in Spain. Um, um, and one is to be published in San Diego, San Diego State University Press. And it's an anthology of women's writings, uh, Chicana, Latina women. And I particularly wanted to have this anthology um, because there aren't many around. We don't pay a lot of attention to the intellectual matter that comes or the artistic matter that comes from uh, Latinas, in particular Chicanas. And so I wanted to do this, and one of the sections, which is the most interesting thing I can say about this, is um, Teresa Talks. Um, because I went to the TED Talk uh, to YouTube and uh, trying to find um, something interesting by Latinas, <laughs> and there was nothing. Um, so I said, well, we're going to have it in writing, since that's what I do. I, um, I publish, I edit, I'm a literary critic and a poet. And so the Teresa Talk section is all these magnificent women um, basically giving advice, um, talking about their experiences, all of this for um, young Latinas, but also in general about their experience living in the United States. So that's a little bit of what I'm working on. But my um, second volume, which I uh, co-edited with a couple other professors, um, presumed incompetent volume two, which are the experiences of women of color in the academy and working class women in the academy. And that just came out um, a couple of months ago, so I've been also promoting that. But you talk about translation. Uh, yeah, it's, I, it's one of the most difficult things to do. So uh, we, we started talking about this last night. I read one of my uh, favorite, best known to me, Neruda poems uh, to you. And uh, I noted that it was uh, translated by the very, very uh, well-known uh, U.S. poet, Robert Bly. And I, I was a little bit surprised. I didn't know that um, he spoke Spanish. And reading his uh, lengthy Wikipedia page in credit, he was involved in a lot of translations. Um, but uh, it, it suggests that Basically, he was given uh, some sort of a draft in English and then crafted the English ver version <laughs> uh, to sort of, uh, you know, squeeze the squeeze the music out of it. And that's such a, 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 a different process than you have because you, you are able to jump so effortlessly between Spanish, uh, not just... Latin American Spanish or Chilean Spanish or Mexican Spanish or um, uh, Spain itself, of course, uh, we, we think, uh, since we live in the United States, we think that there is some one version of Spanish there, but it is a uh, relatively small place with an, uh, uh, regional dialects that uh, tra transition all the way into uh, separate but related Romance languages with different influences from Arabic and so forth. Um, and you sit there and very occasionally you'll ask me for a uh, some sort of nuance in colloquial English 
uh, which I'm I'm happy to supply. But it's it's a solo effort on your part. Yeah, um, I think that uh, translators have been the most undervalued professionals in the field, and in fact, uh, many of them. Well, they're underpaid and overworked, as most other people. But um, at this time, and and I laugh because, of course, I loved Ro- I love Robert Bly. But people felt that it was nothing to translate, right? And I just a, a clerical work. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, about my long saga with um, uh, translating. Um, revising a translation um, of some of Elena Maria Viramontes, is, um, one of the major Chicana um, authors, her short stories. And, and, um, and, and you've gone both ways. You, you've taken an English original <laughs> and made it into mm-hmm. effective and musical uh, but, uh, uh, Mexican border mm-hmm. Spanish yeah. So I wanted to say that one of the exercises that I love to um, to have my students do, particularly with Neruda, but also with the other well-known poets, um, is to get them to go to the library um, and find different translations for the same poem. And when you read them, they're basically different poems. Yeah, I, I, it occurred to me to ask you, uh, I, I read the Enigmas last night to you in English. How did that go over? <laughs> and let, let's admit that I'm a beautiful reader, first of all. <laughs> um, but You are. Ha, ha, and I, and ha, ha, I was, I think I tricked you into reading Poema Veinte for me because I've always wanted you to do oh, that. Oh, so. <laughs> okay. I, so, uh, I, I, I didn't realize there was a whole different agenda oh, here to what we're there's, doing. There's okay. several layers here. Right. But nonetheless, of course, you are a beautiful reader. But it's what adjectives, you know, what We are verbs. on open airwaves. Uh, call me. I'm fishing for more compliments right now. Oh, <laughs> we have much, much more to say yeah. about. But I was going to finish my story about Elena Maria yeah. Viramontes' short stories. So when I first opened the collection and supposedly had this supposedly perfect translation by this Spanish woman, I did not recognize the short stories that I teach. Um, oh my gosh, it was it sounded nothing. It had nothing of her essence. And in terms of Neruda, I think there's so many mistranslations. Um, it's not that it's not beautiful, but it's not Neruda. And uh, that's all I will say. Uh, as the Italians say, uh, traduttore, traditore translator trader and i in with my own poems unless i translate them um or i consult with someone uh who's doing the work uh i don't consider them my own um the same thing when i was translating a lot of these poems by chicano authors who don't speak spanish and we're having this uh collection of poetry come out in Spain by Polivea Press in Madrid. And what I had to do is consult with them. I don't believe you should ever, ever, did you mean this or did you mean that, right? What is what is the edge that you want to give this? Do you want to give it a, a street edge, you know, uh, from the hood or uh, a, a rural edge? What What are you trying to do? Because the verbs that you utilize are very different. So anyway, just to uh, say um, in synthesis that um, you have to thank people for doing the very difficult work of translating, especially before computers. Um, I did want to read just a little section of the Ode to the Dog in Spanish. Okay. Because you have the poem to the dog, which, of course, there's a dog buried in the secret garden. So. Over, over by some rusty machinery. Yes. <laughs> and I, I don't think you said that before. And, but, it's, but it's so important that, uh, your, that your reading of that poem almost made me cry. Um, 
but this is a node to the dog. Now, dogs, as we see them in uh, today's generations, would never understand that in poor countries, dogs are nothing, especially in the first part of the 20th century. Um, they are born, God knows why, or may they, maybe they could be guard dogs, but they're, they use chains on them, they, they mistreat them, they feed them, whatever. I mean, we have canned food for dogs. Dogs eat better than a lot of poor people in this country. Um, they're treated better. They're given their bones and their toys. and their, This is not what happened in Latin America. So, so for him to write two poems, at least, to a dog, um, we have to really go back and start thinking of the world vision uh, regarding a dog at the time. So dogs, like billionaires over the last 50 years, have done very well for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of us are treading water. All right. And I think he could understand, Pablo Neruda could really understand that love for a dog because they were um, his children. So we're on uh, KBFG 107.3. Low Power Community Radio for North Seattle and streaming on the World Wide Web at kbfgseattle.org slash listen. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Gabriela Gutierrez Imus, and she is going to read Ode to a Dog in Spanish. El perro me pregunta y no respondo. Salta, corre en el campo y me pregunta sin hablar y sus ojos son dos preguntas húmedas dos llamas líquidas que interrogan y no respondo no respondo porque no sé no puedo nada a campo pleno vamos hombre y perro brillan las hojas como si alguien las hubiera besado una por una suben del suelo todas las naranjas a establecer pequeños planetarios en árboles redondos como la noche y verdes. Y perro y hombre vamos oliendo el mundo, sacudiendo el trébol por el campo de Chile, entre los dedos claros de septiembre. El perro se detiene, persigue las abejas, salta el agua intranquila, escucha, lejanísimos ladridos, orina en una piedra y me trae la punta de su hocico a mí como un regalo. Es su frescura tierna la comunicación de su ternura y ahí me pregunto con sus dos ojos por qué es de día, por qué vendrá la noche, por qué la primavera nos trajo en su canasta nada para perros errantes sino flores inútiles, flores, flores, flores. Y así pregunta el perro, y no respondo. Vamos, hombre y perro, reunidos por la mañana verde, por la incitante soledad vacía, en que solo nosotros existimos. Esta unidad de perro con Rocío y el poeta del bosque, porque no existe el pájaro escondido, ni la secreta flor, sino trino y aroma para dos compañeros, para dos cazadores compañeros, un mundo humedecido por las destilaciones de la noche, un túnel verde y luego una pradera, una ráfaga de aire anaranjado, el susurro de las raíces, la vida caminando, respirando, creciendo, y la antigua amistad, la dicha de ser perro y ser hombre convertida en un solo animal que camina moviendo seis patas y una cola con rocío. So at the end he becomes one with the dog. So it's one man and six legs. Right? <laughs> and he speaks about this dog, um, uh, you know, peeing. I mean that... Where was there pee in a poem before this? <laughs> Not during modernism in Latin America. So this is nothing to us, this lyricism of Neruda. But it's extraordinary because it changes our perspective of the world. And it makes um, things that apparently are not poetic, poetry. 
I've got one that you printed out for me to read, and mm -hmm. uh, I'll just okay. say it, it. Reading over the the first stanza, I, I it, it made uh, the great epic uh, poem "Howl" by Allen Ginsberg come to light uh, in my mind. Uh, a lot of us, all of us, nearly all of us, are struggling with our identity and uh, the identity of this nation and what's happening right now, uh, the break with the past that we've all experienced is unlike anything that anyone anyone alive has, has uh, gone through. And um, it is, uh, we need to acknowledge that it's, it's very challenging to find uh, your your own course and uh, a, a sailing term, an even keel, and and to uh, keep moving forward. And um, this is called Walking Around by Pablo Neruda. It so happens I am sick of being a man. And it happens that I walk into tailor shops and movie houses, dried up, waterproof, like a swan made of felt, steering my way in a water of wombs and ashes. The smell of barber shops make me break into hoarse sobs. The only thing I want to, to lie like still stones or wood. The only thing I want to see, no more stores, no more gardens, no more goods, no spectacles, no elevators. It so happens that I am sick of my feet and my nails and my hair and my shadow. It so happens I am sick of being a man. Still, it would be marvelous to terrify a law clerk with a cut lily or smack a nun with a blow on the ear. It would be great to go through the streets with a green knife letting out yells until I died of the cold. I don't want to go on being a root in the dark, insecure, stretched out, shivering with sleep, going on down into the moist guts of the earth, taking in and thinking, eating every day. I don't want so much misery. I don't want to go on as a root and a tomb, alone under the ground, a warehouse with corpses, half frozen, dying of grief. That's why Monday, when it sees me coming with my convict face, blazes up like gasoline, and it howls on its way like a wounded wheel and leaves tracks full of warm blood leading toward the night. And it pushes me into certain corners, into some moist houses, into hospitals where the bones fly out the window, into shoe shops that smell like vinegar, and certain streets hideous as cracks in the skin. There are sulfur-colored birds and hideous intestines hanging over the doors of houses that I hate, and there are false teeth forgotten in a coffee pot. There are mirrors that ought to have wept from shame and terror. There are umbrellas everywhere and venoms and umbilical cords. Mm. I stroll along serenely with my eyes, my shoes, my rage, forgetting everything. I walk by going through office buildings and orthopedic shops and courtyards with washing hanging from the line, underwear, towels, and shirts from which slow, dirty tears are falling. So the ordinary becomes <laughs> poetry. <laughs> wow. Yes, that's, um, I wanted to make sure that we included that poem because it's really about today. And, but for a person who traveled the entire world and been an ambassador in France and Italy and Ceylon and to speak about how tired he is of being a man, about the humanity, about the everyday, about the monotonous, and make it into poetry. That's why he was so universal and so well-loved and respected. Um, however, I do want to say that what he considered his best contribution to the world was... Um, that when he was an ambassador in Spain and the um, Civil War, almost at the end of the Civil War. 1939, this yes, would have been. Yeah. Yes, he um, was 
solely responsible for raising money to bring 2,000 people to Chile. All of these were refugees, they were Republicans, they were against the, the horrible Franco regime. By, by the way, this is, of course, not United States Republicans. The Republicans no, uh, very... in, in, during the Spanish Civil War were the, uh, uh, the, the, the supporters of the duly elected government that uh, uh, General Franco staged a coup against in, in a uh, four-year civil war. That ultimately ended in his 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 winning and the duly elected government mm -hmm. being uh, defeated. So he has a poem from España en el Corazón, which is a collection he wrote in um, in France about the Spanish Civil War. It's called El General Franco en los Infiernos. General Franco in hell. <laughs> so with his poetry, he moved the world. He got, you know, the Chileans to ex accept 2,000 people for, you know, whose lives changed. And they were welcomed and loved, adored, cheered when they arrived in Chile. Um, you know, because of this poet. So, as I said before, his poetry directly linked to action. He, that was his greatest achievement in his life, he felt. Mm -hmm. And I, I think so, too. And it would be interesting to, to talk to those, um, to those people, to some of the, you know, their children or great-grandchildren. And I think uh, certainly one of, our, one of our many goals in, in reading uh, Neruda this morning is uh, to uh, not only turn poetry into action, but also uh, for the activists who have been out there uh, working so hard, especially recently, to try to change change the world and change the country and change people's hearts. It's hard work, and it's um, you get yelled at and put down a lot. Uh, we saw. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ocasio Cortez uh, respond uh, very vigorously to that uh, a couple of days ago, but it, it is hard work, and uh, uh, and her I, response was very poetic, might I add? <laughs> and, and, I, and I think um, you know if you're if you're feeling down, uh, don't don't just uh, get involved in some self care like putting on a cucumber mask. Uh, crack open, crack open a book of Neruda, and have yourself uh, a little session with that, and uh, I think you will come away restored. Yes, one particular thing that I adore about him is that he exemplifies the very generous spirit of Latin Americans, which is to include others in everything that you do. So a lot of his poems and um, were to Bolivar, they were to other people that had made things happen in Latin America. They were to, he would be writing poems to all of you activists out there. He would already have a poem to um, AOC today. Mm -hmm. He was about the contemporary, but he also shared his podium and elevated others. That is something I learned at a very early age from him, that you have to be gracious and loving to others. It does not take away, you know, a slice of your pie to include others. Um, and that's what he did. He, he wrote poems to everybody that was worth men mentioning. Um, we are at about 9.54. Uh, we're not in any particular hurry, although John's over there standing in the sun, looking at the flowers, trying to wake up still, I'm pretty sure. Um, but he seems happy. He's smiling over there. He, he's in no particular hurry. Um, I've got one I'd, I'd like to go out with. Do you have one you'd like to go out I with? I have five. <laughs> you got five. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, why don't why don't you go ahead? Let, let me do a station ID, and then uh, you can you can get started, and we'll. Uh, no, we're we're good. Uh, this is KBFG, 
107.3 Low Power FM Community Radio for North Seattle and streaming on the World Wide Web at kbfgseattle.org slash listen. Uh, my name's Eric, and I'm here with Dr. Uh, Gabriela gutierrez uh professor at Seattle University, and we have been digging into Nobel Prize laureate Pablo Neruda. Give us a poem, doctor. Yes, you asked me about translators also. I want to highlight Forrest Ganders and our own regional Copper Canyon for for. for publishing The Lost Neruda. It's called Then Come Back. And um, they found, you know, several, 20 poems more of Neruda's. This is Poema Dos, number two. Never alone with you over the earth, crossing through fire. Never alone with your thoughts, the forest finding again dawn's stiff arrow. The tender moss of spring with you in my struggle not the one i chose but the only one with you through the streets and sand with you my love my exhaustion the bread the wine poverty and glint of one coin wounds sorrow happiness all the light shadow stars all the cut wheat like a coastline cross all the space the autumn the carnations never alone with you never alone with you earth with you the sea my life all i am all i give and everything i sing the substance of this love the earth the sea bread a life Again, this is from Then Come Back, the Lost Neruda uh, collection. They found his poems, um, posthumous poems. And I will keep reading in Spanish this one. I would like to go out in his language. We didn't talk much about his life, his three wives, his three houses. <laughs> But I will, this is the last one, and it's one of the hundred sonnets which he wrote in his 50s to his third wife, most of these. Um, and I will read sonnet 25. So you can hear the music. Antes de amarte, amor, nada era mío. Vacilé por las calles y las cosas. Nada contaba ni tenía nombre. El mundo era del aire que esperaba. Yo conocí salones cenicientos, túneles habitados por la luna, hangares crueles que se despedían, preguntas que insistían en la arena. Todo estaba vacío, muerto y mudo, caído, abandonado y decaído. Todo era inalienablemente ajeno. Todo era de los otros y de nadie hasta que tu belleza y tu pobreza llenaron el otoño de regalos. And I know you have something to go out with as well. I do. Uh, I do. Uh, you are listening to KBFG 107.3, Community Radio for North Seattle, and streaming on the World Wide Web at kbfgseattle.org slash listen. Uh, we do have a call-in number, uh, but don't feel obligated to call. Uh, we've got uh, we we can we can hold down both sides of a conversation here. <laughs> <laughs> and, more, easily, and more, there should um, be more programs yeah, on yeah, Neruda. <laughs> yeah, we could we could read Neruda all day. I think uh, on a, uh, do a twenty-four hour Neruda. Yes, uh, a Neruda ton. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, but we do have a, a phone number which uh, theoretically will work, and I might even answer it. Uh, I don't answer my phone that much, but 206-317-4518 if you want to call in. Uh, we are near the top of the hour, and we have been uh, reading and listening uh, to uh, Pablo Neruda and uh, with my good friend of many years, uh, Dr. Gabriela Gutierrez-Imus. Um, 
My introduction to uh, Neruda actually came via a really interesting movie that I believe I saw with you. Um, this would have been in the early 90s, uh, Mind Walk. Um, it's uh, essentially a conversation between a physicist and a politician and a writer. Uh, he was a speech writer for the politician, but he's also a poet. Um, and... Uh, they're at Mont Saint Michel, and they meet uh, kind of by accident, and they spend the day together talking about all kinds of stuff, and about how to change the world. And um, the poet isn't entirely convinced by the politician, and he quotes the last few lines of this poem, uh, which I, I really do like. Uh, it's it's an internal poem in some ways. It, it, it takes the world and it, it, it internalizes it and tries to find meaning like so much of, of uh, Neruda's work. So it, 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 it does speak to me and a lot of other folks too. This is called The Enigmas. You've asked me what the lobster is weaving there with his golden feet. I reply, the ocean knows this. You say, what is the Ascidia waiting for in its transparent bell? What is it waiting for? I tell you, it is waiting for time, like you. You ask me whom the macrocystis algae hugs in its arms. Study it, study it at a certain hour in a certain sea, I know. You question me about the wicked tusk of the narwhal, and I reply by describing how the sea unicorn with the harpoon in it dies. You inquire about the kingfisher's feathers, which tremble in the pure springs of the southern tides. Or you found in the cards a new question touching on the crystal architecture of the sea anemone, and you'll deal that to me now. You want to understand the electric nature of the ocean spines, the armored stalactite that breaks as it walks, the hook of the anglerfish, the music stretched out in the deep places like a thread in the water. I want to tell you the ocean knows this, that life in its jewel boxes is endless as the sand, impossible to count pure, and among the blood-colored grapes time has made the petal hard and shiny, made the jellyfish full of light and untied its knot, letting its musical threads fall from a horn of plenty made of infinite mother of pearl. I am nothing but the empty net which has gone on ahead of human eyes, dead in those darknesses, of fingers accustomed to the triangle, longitudes on the timid globe of an orange. I walked around as you do, investigating the endless star, and in my net during the night I woke up naked, the only thing caught, a fish trapped inside the wind. And that was translated by Robert Bly. Pablo Neruda. And also there's Il Postino. Ah, uh, yeah, a lovely movie. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't know if it's on Netflix or, but... Uh, About his life in Italy. I Italy. When he was uh, exiled there. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, he strikes up a friendship with a guy who was delivering a lot of lever lot of letters and packages to this this guy what what's going on and they they start talking um beautiful the postman il postino italian movie uh so i hope you find uh neruda i hope you find uh some some beauty in these uh tough times we're going to try to bring you a little uh creative beauty here <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Gabriela Gutierrez y Mus and um, just uh, thank you the instruments are starting to <laughs> to make their way into the poem yeah um, so off with the headphones and um, 